I'm Adriana Gascoigne, founder of Girls in Tech, and this is the Girls in Tech podcast, where we're discussing the ways tech is always evolving and helping the world evolve too. Listen in, get inspired, and learn how you can use your skills to create the change you want to see in the world. Here's your host, Zuzi Martin Ali. There's a company that will value you for you. There's a tech job where your skill set and unique perspectives are appreciated. By inviting you to share the real you, the Girls in Tech Jobs Board helps you find that job so that you can take the next step in your career with confidence. Go to jobs.girlsintech.org today. That's jobs.girlsintech.org. And one of my big hopes for Clue is that I can expand culture so that women can have more space to express what they really experience and express their needs because we have specific needs because of what our bodies are doing and we need to live in a world where where we don't have to pretend that uh, that you know that we are working on a straight line we are working on curves when apple introduced its health kit in 2014 the company boasted that it would track several major health factors how many steps we take sodium intake weight heart rate and much more but they forgot one of the most important things to roughly half of the people on the planet they didn't include a way for women to track their menstrual cycles, which is very important to us and a critical part of understanding our health. For millions of women around the world, a period tracking app is a must-have tool. It helps us understand our bodies. But without women advocating for the importance of women's health and other issues in tech, our concerns and needs are being overlooked. Ida Tin is a Danish entrepreneur working to make sure women are seen and empowered to use technology as a way to make the world a better place from the female perspective. In 2012, she co-founded Clue, now one of the most popular period tracking apps in the world with more than 14 million users. She's also credited with coining the term femtech, that means female technology. Ida sees a future where women can better understand their bodies and take control of their health beyond periods. She shares that to do that, we need technology and data working together, as well as more women in tech and at the boardroom table to build tools and products made to include and address the female perspective. Here's my conversation with Ida. I would love to know, you know, what was going through your head when you decided to co-found Clue and you're the CEO now. Um, and let's start there. I have so many yeah. questions. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me on the show. Um, so I had the idea for Clue almost a decade ago. Well, actually over a decade ago. And it really started with this question of why has there been so little innovation in family planning methods since the pill came out? Because I thought, well, now we have sensors and we have supercomputers in our pockets. What if we could just know really accurately which days we can actually get pregnant and where we are in the cycle? Then maybe we could, you know, take out the phone and it would be like, hey, today you can get pregnant, don't worry. <laughs> or today, you know, use a condom. Um, and I thought that would be really helpful for me, but also maybe meeting a, a global need for contraceptives. So that was the spark. And then, long story, but um, decided to sort of start in period tracking because half of the world's population had periods for many years. And that seemed like a good, a good starting point to start a conversation about female health and start understanding the space. And then as we've been building that, we understood that there are um, so many more things you can do with that data beyond contraception and period tracking. So, but that was the first initial spark. And I have to say, it really was a provocation. I was like, really? <laughs> we put people on the moon, but we still don't know which day we're ovulating. Like, how is this even possible? So. So you started with periods and sort of on this contraception uh, slash fertility role, but there's there's so much more to to women's health and so much more you're trying to do. What makes uh, Clue different from other period trackers and, and what's out there in the marketplace on a holistic level? I should just clarify that Clue as it is today is not a contraceptive. Um, that's really important to say. We are not regulated to be a contraceptive and we don't recommend that people use it as such. Um, so as a founder and somebody building tech, you make a lot of ethical choices on how you build the product and how you build the team, but also sort of what cultural norms do you really pass on? And I think one of the things that makes Clue quite different is sort of our value set around female health. We saw that a lot of the products already in the market were very sort of 
gender stereotypical um, and a little bit sort of secretive and very girly, very flowery pink. And so we wanted to make something that was very science-based, very non nonsense and very transparent, um, really trying to educate and explain our users what happens to your data, how do we make money, why are we doing this, <laughs> where are we coming from? Um, and I still feel that this is one of the things that make cool different from what's in the market. Um, I feel that I have been very privileged to be able to do this work. Um, 100 years ago, women were put into prison to talk, you know, for talking about reproductive health. So in that way, I feel I've been born at a very lucky time where technology has become available and there is just enough space culturally to have these conversations. And one of my big hopes for Ku is that I can expand culture so that women can have more space to express what they really experience and express their needs because we have specific needs because of what our bodies are doing. And we need to live in a world where, where we don't have to pretend that, uh, that, you know, that we are working on a straight line. We are working on curves. And that means we have, you know, different needs at different days. And I would love the world to make space for that. Can you talk a little bit how you make data helpful to women? Yeah, so when we started collecting data, we really soon realized that it's not enough to mirror the data back to a user. You really have to be able to make it meaningful and helpful, which means you need to provide context for the data. You know, what does it mean if my app tells me I have a 40 day cycle and should I be worried or is it fine? And so one of the things with data is that people can start understanding what their baseline is, what's natural for them, what's healthy for them. And with that, we can also understand when something starts going a little off and we can go to our healthcare providers and say, hey, look, here's the data, look at it. <laughs> and that's important because uh, we have so many stories where women say like, my doctor didn't believe me or they didn't take me seriously or I was told that, you know, yeah, it hurts to be a woman or, but now with data in our hands, we are much more empowered to actually get the care that we need and also to think about how we stay healthy. How do we do preventive care? And I think that's one of the really big promises for bringing technology to female health is that women can start understanding their bodies better and uh, take more ownership over, you know, what's happening to them, especially in female health, where we have a pretty gruesome history of women being very disempowered and having things done to them that, you know, weren't at all great. Um, and, and we still have some of these issues. So it's something that hopefully people can take and create the lives that they really want to have with. Can you share some examples of how women are taking this information, this data and, and changing their lives? Because, you know, as women, I think when it comes to our, our reproductive health, especially, we start searching for answers a little bit too late, perhaps, or mm. we're just really scared to discover what might be there for some strange reason. Um, yeah. Can you share some empowering stories of, of mm. how this information is changing women's lives? Hmm. So one of the really inspiring thing that I've learned doing this work for, for a long time now is to understand that our cycles really are a cycle where something is happening every day. It's not just about our periods. We have this extraordinary complex system kicking in and changing our physiology every day. And it affects our sexuality. It affects our mood. It affects our skin. It affects so many things. And I feel that when people understand better you know, the signals that are coming from their bodies and what they see in the app, they can be less afraid, you know, that day where you just feel miserable, you know, maybe it's just because of hormones and actually what you need is to take care of yourself or have somebody be extra kind that day. But also we have people who said, you know, they recognize that they had a pregnancy outside the womb early, it saved their lives. Or we have people who are recognized that of cancer early. We have people who, um, have improved the relationship to the partners because they understand better some of these mood swings. We have people who understand that they had a chronic disease that they needed to get treated for. So everything that makes you feel, I guess, more in control to some level, like you will never have control over your body. And maybe that's a good thing, <laughs> actually, um, because I think our body teaches us a lot. Um, but to some extent that we don't feel that we are just sort of helplessly 
being pulled around by these changes in our bodies so that we can sort of have enough extra sort of perspective maybe on them to understand that they're also beneficial because I think our bodies are very clever I think when they when the body tells us to slow down maybe that's not a bad thing then we have other kinds of ideas and understand other ideas you know I think we become wiser (laughs) Um, and that reminds me of the name you know just going back to the name for a second is is that why you called it clue so that we could catch a clue catch a clue yes. a little clue about what's going on with our bodies yes my idea was that you would have a piece of technology that would have, like give you a clue right it would sort of help you understand something and then you can you can go figure out the full picture but had like a helping hand yeah <laughs> it's perfect. It's perfect. Um, you've said before that you're not necessarily trying to make profits. You've said you're playing the long game. What What does that mean? And what's what's the long game for you? I mean, we definitely want to make money because um, that's how we get to do this work sustainably for our users for a long time. But as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, when we build technology, we make many choices of how aggressive do we try to upsell people or do we sell the data? Do we put advertisement in? Like there are many choices we make where we make a trade-off of making money or doing something that we think are good for users. And my belief has always been that you do what's good for users. And by doing that, you build a product that has that provides a, a lot of real value for users. And in the end, people will be willing to pay for that value. And so that's that's been our principles, uh, principle on, on how to think about monetization. Um, but of course, it is also, you know, we are competing with people who maybe are willing to be much more aggressive. And so it's always a balance of how do we, yeah, keep the, having the privilege to do this work and how do we make sure that we do the best we can for users. And we have been very fortunate to have a very supportive user base who are willing to pay for Clue. We have um, Clue Plus, which is, like a premium subscription. Um, and we've been experimenting with different things. And in the beginning, it really was just a donation subscription. Like you wouldn't get anything extra, but it was purely for people who felt that they could afford it and wanted to support the work we do and specifically our science work. Um, now we're adding more things behind the paywall, hoping that you know more people will be um, compelled and, and many more people are. And we're very grateful for it. And I, and I want to say that beyond just sort of making clues as any business, I feel it's very important that we kind of educate people that we need to pay for software. Because if we don't pay for software, people pay with their data or they pay with their attention. And I don't think that's the world, that's not the world I would like to be part of creating. I'd rather create a world where it's very transparent. You know exactly what you get and what you give, <laughs> rather than the business model be, being sort of hidden. And if users really understood what the business model were for a specific product, they might not actually want to use the product. I think that's quite dangerous because then you know, we take some freedom away from people. You know, we get manipulated or we get influenced by a lot of advertisement we might not be so interested in. And so I think it's good for people to know that when they pay for a product, they have sort of a more clear contract. They get a more clean product. I think it's better. You're talking about the exchange of, I mean, I don't think people realize that overtly, you know, especially when you're talking about your, the most personal thing that could possibly, you know, affect you, your, your personal health, your fertility, your reproductive system, your entire holistic self. And you're talking about giving your data away for free in cases where you're getting a product for free sometimes versus mm. paying for the product and protecting your personal data. I mean, I think it's scary right now at this moment in time because there's a big lack of trust when it comes to data. So how do you protect data? No, but I think as a consumer, I think it's a very challenging time because it is extraordinarily complex to understand how data and money is being exchanged. And actually, I would say as an average consumer, you really have no fair chance to understand that. You can read the small print in the terms of service, which of course nobody does. Uh, and it's most cases written to not be understood. And most times it will say, as a company, we can do anything with your data. <laughs> and that's huge concerning. And I, my wish would be that we had maybe some sort of certification, like we had, have on 
on, on bioproducts that would say this is a good data practice company. You know, some very easy navigation for consumers um, where we establish some set of standards of what is good data privacy practice. I mean, we have a clue made a choice for ourselves because that's it. That's where we are coming from. That's what I think is the right thing to do is to not sell data. That's the DNA of our company. And we try to explain users that is the case. But, but I would say generally, I'm really excited to see that this has become much more of a conversation in the last four years and more people are being more yeah, concerned about data privacy because there was also this point in the conversation or sort of where people say, well, we've, you know, we, it's a lost game. Like there is no privacy anymore. And I don't think it's true. And I think not many people want to accept that as a truth. And so that's how we create the world is that we say, no tech companies, you actually have to, you know, treat my data with respect and, and honor the trust that it is to share this very intimate data. How do you see femtech on a grander scale i'd love to know you know how you think it's changing the way we talk and and what inspires you um to keep going in the direction of empowering women's health mm. i think there's still a piece around convenience that we haven't really solved we have our data fractured on many different apps and um, in the doctor's office etc and i feel like we need to still do a better job of making people's data come together and be really helpful for them actually enable them to do something with the data or do more with the data so i think that's that's a development we're going to see i i also think we'll start being able to look into the body on a more molecular level so i know there are already people working on analyzing period blood and saliva testing and other things that will help us really get real-time data on what's happening in the body i think that's exciting and again, all of this is really only helpful if what we do with the data is helpful, if it's done in a way that's in, in, you know, human and empathic and actually makes people feel good because we create culture when we build technology and especially in female health, we have to be very mindful that we don't make people feel that they're not normal or not right. Or I think that's one place where it's extraordinarily important to have diversity on the team's building technology, because that's how you get those pieces right. That's how you actually meet people where they are. And also people who have a vision and a desire to, to shape the world in their image, you know, whether you are a woman or of color or anything else, you know, that you can do your thing and be taken serious and, you know, not being considered some outlier. <laughs> so. I love that vision of the future of femtech. You said we, we have to do more in the area of convenience. Um, what other areas, what new ways do you think technology can help women understand their own health? Like what's the vision for the future? You know, I always have this picture in my mind that what if we could paint this sort of landscape for people so they understand sort of where were they coming from and where they're heading and over here there's like, a, you know, a cliff we don't want to fall down. You know, this is my risk for breast cancer because of my mother's history or, you know, if I go on birth control, I'll be over in this part of the landscape. You know, it's sort of way for people to navigate because we make so many choices. You know, when am I going to have children if at all? Am I going to freeze my eggs or not? Do I do hormonal birth control or something else. And I, I would love to somehow take all this data and create that landscape so people can navigate. And with that, I think we can start, as I mentioned, to really do preventive care. Because what you also said, right, often we're sort of taken a little bit by surprise, like, oh, suddenly I realized that this thing I've been suffering with the last five years, like if only I'd known, I could have, you know, taken better care, I could have avoided these follow down effects, etc. I don't know, for me, right now in my life, I'm 41. I think it would be great to know when I'm gonna go into menopause. When do we build you know, an algorithm that can predict that with some sort of level of certainty? What's the input that I need to figure out to give that algorithm so that I can get that result out? Um, I think that would be fantastic. I think there's a huge space around contraceptives, you know, whether they're hormonal or non-hormonal. Right now, the way that people get prescribed hormonal birth control is like middle age. It's like, take this pill package and see if you have side effects. Why is it not standard that we get our hormone levels screened and get something that's custom built that actually fits our bodies? You know, it might be simple things like, is there a trusted place where I can ask a gynecologist about advice or a therapist or a forum or like just bringing things out of the dark? <laughs> Maybe that's sort of the common theme. We need to bring things out of the dark. I love that. I, I love exactly everything you just said. I feel like it's so 
possible. It's, and when it happens, it's mm-hmm. going to be one of those things that we say, why the heck did this, why the hell, cause you know, I'll, I'll just be blunt. Why the hell didn't we do this sooner? Like why, mm-hmm. why? You know, I think a big, I, I ask myself that too. And I think sometimes the answer is very simple. It's because, because women don't talk enough about it. You know, it's like, how do we, how do we raise our voice and say, no, this is a valid problem to try and solve. Let's look at this. You know, I do want to know why I get cysts all the time. I do want to know why black women die more having babies in the U.S. than white women. I do want to know why are women not being included enough in medical clinical trials? Well, it's inconvenient because they have cycles, but yes, but that's the point. So really it's about how do we start asking these questions and how do we bring awareness? Because a lot of the time, the decision makers and the people building product and the people who give investment dollars, they just simply don't have it top of mind. So we need to create the space and culture where we can just make it visible. That leads me to to my next question. Why do you think, and you're sort of answering it already, why is it important for women to get involved in creating new technologies? It's important because it has something to do with which products are being built at all. Like what problems are we actually trying to solve? Then it's important because we need to build products for everybody (laughs) in a way that's inclusive. And if we don't have enough diversity we have too many blind spots and we end up building something that a lot of people can't relate to and doesn't they don't feel invited to be part of Um, and i also think that when we have diversity we will question each other's value sets and ethics and not just sort of agree on some things that maybe we wouldn't quite be willing to stand up for if we really had to be really open about it because somebody confronted us and so i think you know, it just creates a sort of health um, guarantee a little bit in an organization that you don't have a group of people that can just agree on something, even though it might be a little off. Um, for people who want to help advance the cause of femtech, where can they start? What advice do you have for them? What skills should they be focusing on? What I would say is take seriously what you think is important. You know, we live in a world where some of the things that men found important became important in the world. And some of the things that women have found important has not yet become important in the world. And I feel that women need to have the courage to say, no, this is an important thing for me. And I do want technology to play a role here. So rather than maybe talking about skills, because women are very smart and they're well-educated and they always think they're not educated enough or smart enough or have enough experience, but really it's the course to say, no, I, I, I decide that I think this is important and I'm going to do something with this. <laughs> and I will find people who are also excited about this. And then actually I would say, how do we promote femtech and how do we move it forward? I don't think we will ever have real change unless we have men be part of that journey. I think the more men are aware what women actually experience and how crazy this journey is sometimes, and actually get excited about building products there and building it together with women. And I built this company with my partner, Hans, who's a man. And I would never have been able to build Clue without him. And I think he's getting way too little uh, credit, actually. Um, and I'm, I guess I'm proud that he as a man have been with me on this journey. Um, and that also makes me very hopeful. I have a team with amazing men, it's entirely possible for men to be part of this. Um, yeah. So I just want to say like he, he needs to be mentioned as well. In, and I should have done this way earlier, but um, one quick question on that. How do you think it's changed the men at Clue to work and develop Clue? I think they're fascinated, just like everybody keeps being fascinated because we learn new things about female health every day. Um, I also think it makes them pissed sometimes and I think it makes them feminists (laughs) and I think it makes them very excited about having a positive impact on the world. It's a huge driver for both men and women in the company. People work at Cool because they want to do something that's meaningful and helpful and that is totally true for the men as well. Yeah, I, I, and also our male investors. We have all male investors, pretty much, except one female angel or a couple of female angels, but all institutional investors are men. 
And I think they've been very brave to do something that was socially maybe a bit awkward. So the men have been a very important part of Pooh's history and still is. <laughs> you sound so passionate and motivated in this space. And I'd love to know what, what keeps you there? Like what keeps you going? <laughs> <laughs> it's deeply meaningful for me I feel that we will only really have equality in the world where women on the most fundamental level feel good about their bodies you know it's, I think it's very hard to have a voice in the world if you kind of doubt or feel shame around your most intimate part <laughs> and um and so I believe that this is a starting point to have women's voices be more heard in the world. And I think that's good for both men and women. And I, by the way, I should say that I think men need a lot of liberation as well. <laughs> but I think you will only really have strong women if you have strong men also that it doesn't have to comply with some gender stereotype. So this sort of, I, I think for me, that's a very deep, meaningful sort of driver that I believe this is part of a road towards equality. But then I'm also excited about the potential. You know, I think, I think we can do great things. Um, and I'm also motivated by users, of course, who say that we're building something of value and that it's helpful. I mean, in the end, this is, we would not be here if it wasn't because of the users. That's, it all starts and ends with them. So. What about women that want to follow in your footsteps? They want to... <laughs> They want to, you know, get on, get on the same path. They want to expand wh from what you've started. What, what have you learned about how to succeed as a startup in this space? And what advice do you have for women that want to forge on this path? Just start. Just simply start. I have spoken to so many women who think about starting companies and they always list this, you know, list of things why they're not ready. And it always has something to do with themselves. You know, they don't have the right skills or they're not, financially independent or they don't have the right co-founder or they don't know about, not enough about the market or something else. And I'm just like, you will never be ready. ready. And you don't even know what you need to know. Who knows? <laughs> Your company might pivot, you know, six months after you started and all that things you prepared doesn't matter anymore. So just start. And then I also quickly want to say that we need to really not glorify being an entrepreneur. For some people, it's wonderful. I'm very grateful that I get to do this work, but it's also tough in many ways and might not be fun for everybody. I, I think we, you know, I just want to make sure we don't create a culture where being an entrepreneur is like the coolest thing on earth. It's very unglamorous to be an entrepreneur, you know? It's, it's a lot of hard work and a lot of um, challenges. But so having said all of that, if I were to give a very concrete advice, I would say, spend a lot of time on your self-development because, you know, learn to tackle those fears and um, in the end, the company will sort of grow together with your self-development and take it seriously that you need to nurture yourself, you need to grow yourself, you need to get supported, you need to stay healthy and, um, and it can be very difficult because we always feel like we need to do more and we feel a bit guilty if we you know, spend that money on that coach maybe or we take that half day off. Or, but I would say allow yourself to really be on a growth journey in a healthy way. That's beautiful advice and it's so true. Uh, thank you. Um, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share? i maybe just say that I... I have a big hope that that this technology that we create in the more privileged part of the world can sort of leapfrog to places where people are, have phones but maybe don't have access to a gynecologist or something else that we can sort of you know bring the bring the forefront of technology to people who are not necessarily in our surroundings here in for me in Europe um, and I think that's a real possibility I'm pretty excited about how to maybe work more on that in the future like let's not forget that there's a whole planet that needs to stay healthy and have education and access and cultural um evolution whatever that means wherever people are thank you that was lovely thank you 
Thank you for listening to today's episode. The Girls in Tech podcast is a production of Coat and Pairs. Were you inspired by what you heard today? Head over to girlsintech.org to find more resources for starting and advancing a career in tech, including our jobs board and personal and professional development programs designed to help you excel. And be sure to tune in every other Tuesday for new episodes. See you next time.